Good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are. My name is Regina. I am a research assistant at the Dennis and Lenora Ferguson Foundation. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you today to today's webinar, led by the Health, Health Policy and Research Division of the Catholic Policy Institute. The webinar is organized within the framework of the Bond Find project. If you're joining us for the first time today, the Bond Find is a mobile application that is designed to help pregnant women within uh, deliver safely, um, during their pregnancy to, live, to deliver safely. The project was, deli was developed by the University of Ottawa in Canada and the Donwell system in Belgium and is sponsored by Grand Challenge Canada. It is being implemented in Cameroon currently by the Dennis and Lenora Forexia Foundation here in Simbox Yaoundé in collaboration with Cyrus in Akunolika. The theme for today's webinar is health promotion, the role of digital health tools in boosting impact. Today we live in a digital era, as we can see, and digital technologies have brought about countless innovation tools for advancing population health, addressing access to health care in a hard to reach areas and lowering cost of health services, just to name a few. Today we will be looking at how we can use digital health to promote health. In other words, how it enables people to increase and improve their health with it, by using digital technology. Now, we will be looking, uh, our moderator for today, uh, panel discussion is no other than Dr. Valerie. Dr. Valerie is a medical doctor at the, and a senior research, at the, as a senior researcher at the Capital Policy Institute, which is a think tank at the Dennis and Lenora Ferretsa Foundation. Now, before his appointment, he was a volunteer research assistant under Professor Bright Nwari at the Crafting Research Center in Gothenburg, Gothenburg, that is in Sweden, during which he conducted various researches in global health and contributed to various systematic reviews to synthesize existing, existing, existing evidence on major global health issues. Now, between the, health, between the year 2012 and 2018, Dr. Andrew worked as a clinician at the Federal Center of Kethi, Nasawara State, which is based in Nigeria, and rose to the position of senior medical officer and chief resident in charge of training. He is a Swedish Institute scholar alumni and has served in numerous leadership positions, including being the chairman of the Swedish Institute Network of Future Global Leaders, chairman of National Union of Cameroon Students, uh, in Nigeria, research group coordinator of the Young African Research Network and electoral committee chairman of the Association of Resident Doctors in Nigeria. Uh, Dr. Valerie, you are most welcome. As a kind reminder, I would like to remind you to turn off your cameras and mics during the discussion. And also during the discussion, if you do have any questions, please ensure that you leave it in the chat box. Dr. Valerie, you have the floor. And thank you, Regina, for this uh, wonderful opportunity. And I want to uh, thank our uh, viewers and those actually participating from different parts of the world. Also, want to thank the panelists for taking their time to be part of this uh, session. I want to, uh, all right, uh, I'll start by introducing uh, four panelists who are actually uh, participating in this webinar, who are actually going to be giving us uh, their experience uh, regarding uh, the use of digital tools in promoting healthcare. Um, joining us in this webinar, we have uh, Dr. Justice Ohaka, who is joining us all the way from Nigeria. Dr. Justin, a medical doctor and a public health expert uh, with uh, a fellowship in the West African uh, College of Physicians. He is a honorary senior registrar at the Department of Community Medicine, River State University Teaching Hospital. He obtained his bachelor degree at the Amadou Bello University at, uh, Teaching Hospital in Zaria, a bachelor in medicine and bachelor in surgery. At Kaduna State, Nigeria, after which she worked as a house officer and, as, and also served as 
a uh, copper with the National Youth Service Corps. Dr. Justice actually is a specialist in epidemiology and he has tremendous clinical and free experience in epidemiological activities. He has worked with the primary healthcare management board at the University of Otaqua Teaching Hospital, Department of Community Medicine, and is currently a lecturer at the River State University College of Medical Sciences and also a case management team lead at River State Ministry of Health. He contributed in revising the, the national guideline of COVID-19 management in Nigeria and also he facilitated the non and um, the Nigerian Center of Disease Control and the WHO supported integrated training of surveillance officers of Nigeria during the training in Port Harcourt River State. Dr. Ohaka Justice is a member of the West African College of Physicians and also a member of the Nigerian Medical Dental Council. He is also he also served in capacity as a professional. I'm sorry, he's also served in different capacities with various professional bodies, including being the PRO and assistant secretary with the Nigerian Medical Association River State Chapter. Dr. Justice, while with the National Association of Government General Medical and Dental Practitioner, he served as a secretary and currently he is the first vice chairman of the River State Chapter of the Association. Dr. Haka Justice is the member of the Association of Public Health Physicians of Nigeria and a member of the Association of Specialist Medical Doctors in Academics, and also a member of the Christian Medical and Dental Council of Nigeria. Dr. Justice has excellent skills in capacity building, resource management, entrepreneurship, and he is a reliable, self-led resource and committed, helping, committed clinician helping others to succeed. He enjoys teaching, and interestingly, he enjoys dancing and swimming. Ohaka Justice is also a native of Iba town in Omoaya, local government area of River State, Nigeria. Dr. Justice, you're welcome to this session. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very you. happy to also have you. Thank you. Also joining us all the way from Pakistan is Dr. Irifan Shafi. Dr. Irfan Shafi is a medical doctor from the Lincoln University of Medical and Health Sciences in Pakistan and has a master's degree in global health from the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Besides being a clinician, Dr. Irfan has considerable interest in investment in agriculture, education, and he is also a philanthropist uh, promoting health and ensuring food security in Pakistan. He has built schools and rehabilitated a lot of facilities and also working towards establishing a charitable organization for the underprivileged in his country, Pakistan. Dr. Rivan Shafi is an elected council member of the Pakistani and, uh, and district government representative. He has been working for the health sector in rural areas by upgrading the local primary health clinic and supporting the sick and the needy. Dr. Mohamed Ifran, we are also happy to have you uh, in this our session. Thank you, Eri. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much. Also joining us all the way from Peru is Henry Chair. Henry is an epidemiology with almost a decade of field and research experience combined and currently running off with his PhD, running off his PhD at the University, American University of Peru. Henry holds a master's degree in epidemiology and infectious disease from the University of Goya, Cameroon, and also a double master at the University of Gothenburg in public health at the University of Gothenburg, Sweden. Henry interest lies in applying his epidemiological and statistical knowledge and experience to solving real-life problems, particularly through evidence-based research and in designing, implementing, and evaluating global public health program. He has been involved in several community-based epidemiological studies on neglected tropical diseases within uh, how to reach communities in Cameroon. He has held other research projects on he has led other research projects on disease prevention and mental health within Cameroon and abroad. Henry's current research uh, actually is based on a cohort study on aging focusing on quantifying the effect of adverse uh, childhood experience 
on cognitive decline in adulthood. Apart from his research, Henry has also received a certification in teaching uh, in higher education and has taught courses in epidemiology, research method, and biostatistics. Henry is passionate about contributing to capacity building through teaching, research, and collaboration, both at home and abroad. Henry, welcome to this panel discussion. We are happy to have you. Thank you so much, Dr. Barry. I'm happy to be here. And uh, one and only uh, powerful lady joining us in this session is Dr. Sekula Jemila Yunusa, who is joining us all the way from Nigeria, Abuja, Nigeria. Dr. Yunusa is a senior registrar at the Federal Medical Center, Abuja, Nigeria. She graduated from the prestigious Amadovera University, Abuja, Nigeria, Kaduna State, with a Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery. Dr. Uh, Jemila is a certified expert in basic life support and advanced, life, uh, and advanced trauma life support protocol, emergency medicine, and surgery. As a senior registrar, she has been actively involved in infectious disease surveillance in Nigeria, including developing and reviewing protocol for infectious disease management in the country. She's a registered physician with the Nigerian Medical and Dental Council, and also a member with the uh, National Association of Resident Doctors in like, Abuja, uh, Nigeria. She has served in various leadership positions, most recently as the Chief Minister of the Department of Family Medicine, Federal Medical Center, Abuja. And she has supported uh, residents uh, in training, including junior residents during their residency program. Dr. Jamila enjoys traveling and also not playing badminton, table tennis, and board games. Dr. Jamila, we are happy to have you. Thank you very Dr. much. Jamila. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, it's quite an interesting session to have all of you. And uh, for this session, and this webinar actually is a uh, part of a project uh, it's sponsored by Grand Challenge Canada. Uh, it's a project called Bonfire and it's being implemented here in Cameroon by the University of Ottawa in collaboration with the OS system. The Dennis and Lenora Foreta Foundation here in Yaoundé and Sirius in Cameroon and Akonolinga, Cameroon. Well, we just go straight to our discussion uh, since we are actually already behind. And I want to apologize for the slow start in the uh, webinar. I would start by actually trying to bring, draw our attention to the WHO definition that uh, takes us back to the fact that health is actually a complete state of physical, mental, and social well-being, and not just the abstinence of diseases to infirmity. And it's on this note that we want to look at how we can actually promote uh, health using digital tools. This is actually one of the, the emerging tools. I mean, digital health is becoming one of the emerging tools that most countries are actually advocating that uh, for nations to achieve the sustainable development goals, uh, they have to, at one moment or the other, implement digital tools as uh, one of those that can help to facilitate attainment to digital. So please, I want to uh, begin this webinar by giving our panelists the opportunity to clarify our doubts because there are a lot of issues relating to digital. Health. When they see digital health, a lot of people keep confusing it, whether digital health refers to the same thing as uh, mobile health, does it also look at it as, some also look at it as telemedicine, Others see it differently. So um, I will give this opportunity to um, Harry, all the way from Beirut, to probably give us some light on how, what is digital health? How do we differentiate all these different appellations, M health, telemedicine? Do, do they actually mean the same thing? Oh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Valerie. So, so to begin, I would uh, like to first of all start with giving a brief definition of what what really digital health is. And what I'll say is, digital health simply refers to like a subdiscipline within the health uh, domain that really harnesses the power of of uh, technology to either uh, through mobile phones, uh, apps, uh, other e platforms to provide health information, uh, provide care, support, uh, monitor health and uh, health risk factors, and also collect information that can inform decision about people's health. Now, 
uh, there are uh, many of these terms that seem confusing within the framework of uh, digital health, such as uh, the ones you mentioned, uh, telemedicine, uh, mobile M health, which is mobile health, and all that. These are just sub themes within uh, the, the framework of digital health. So when you talk about M health, it's a bit more specific to using mobile devices or ap applications uh, to drive healthcare or, or promote health. So that is M health, mobile health. Uh, when you talk about um, telemedicine, it basically uses digital communication technology or digital platforms to provide health information, uh, provide support and all that. So these are basically uh, sub themes within the framework of uh, 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 digital health. So hopefully uh, by the end of the, the webinar, we will be able to dive into uh, some of these uh, areas and it will hopefully not be as confusing as uh, for the participants as uh, they are before the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, um, Henry. And you actually uh, re-emphasize on the different terminologies that have actually been uh, confusing. And um, probably I would like to also hear from you, Dr. Justice Ohaka, uh, your, your own view about digital health, I mean, when this confusion and misuse of terminologies, what can you say about it as well? I would add, uh, like to add that um, digital health technology actually brings you know, health services. Uh, directly to the people's, you know, use. You know, there are a lot of communities that you can assess technically. And um, the use of digital health today has helped us to have access to such communities and, of course, make healthcare more responsive and, of course, very productive as well. So if we talk about digital health, we're talking about the fact that it's been, you know, reported that digital health technologies, such as the telehealth, like we're talking about, you know, when used for health service, you know, we can, it's, because um, in course of the pandemic, we found out that a lot of people, you know, now you know, use a questionnaire-based platform to do their research programs and all of that. So that's the essence of you know using data. It also helps to help in uh, trying to uh, uh, get across to what people can do when it comes to health survey, data collection, in terms of surveillance, health awareness campaigns and offer also decision support systems from different sources, you know, can be used to prevent and also control even the pandemic that we're talking about. Because during the pandemic, most of us were at home. So it was with the use of digital health technologies and platforms that some of us, try, um, you know, thrive within the, uh, the period. So all of, the, all of this technically coming without disrupting, you know, or preventing, sorry, disrupting social order. So digital health, to me, gives a more organized system where people from all walks of life interact at that platform. And it's, it's, it helps to also give coverage. For instance, I'm in Nigeria, you're in Cameroon, we have other people from Pakistan. This is something that we can harness and then give the best of health globally. So that's an extra you know, information um, I would also... Now, for us, it, within the public health space, we can also use data health to track and contact trace are, you know, uh, um, do contact tracing application monitors that help to, you know, reach out to people that you can't necessarily, you know, reach out. So those are the three, the few points I would like to also add um, concerning data health. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You actually did mention about uh, how pandemics have actually pop up and then probably uh, influence the way digital health is seen nowadays. Um, it's actually on, uh, I mean, studies conducted in 2017 showed that over 3,500 digital health applications are available for download on different um, media pl platforms. And that tells you to, I mean, how far digital health uh, is actually um, skyrocketing globally. And then I, I keep wondering what actually some of the factors, what has actually pushed and this uh, rapid emergence of digital health, because uh, when uh, digitalization was actually increasing across other sectors, economics, finance, to some extent, health was a little bit dragged behind. Until recently, 
the, the, a, a kind of uh, search in the use of digital head globally. What could be this uh, a driver behind this sudden or sharp increase in the use of digital head application? Probably I think with, uh, Yes, let me, let me just make okay. an insight into that. Of course, just like I said, the use of digital health tools, you know, have helped to um, bring public health, um, so to speak, surveillance, contact tracing. We've seen the importance because it has reduced the, your, your, your coming to have a contact with the patient vis-a-vis -vis exposing yourself, you look at it from the part where you also, um, the, the, the cost effectiveness, the cost effectiveness in terms of um, the monies you spend, physically going out to meet patients, physically reaching out to different facilities and all of that. These are things you can now stay at home at convenience to do and also to drive. Data health also, you know, have health professionals, healthcare professionals for their own safety while providing continued health care. These are things that are very palpable and things that we can see physically. And of course, the potential of data health being harnessed in these areas are, you know, quite enormous. Government has come into you data health because it is for them very capital, uh, um, less capital intensive. So if you look at it from that point of view as well, it gives you a kind of a, a, a fallback. And then you're not spending so much on trying to set up some structures and technicalities in terms of pandemic response, you know, or disease uh, response and the like. So, I mean, I, I, I believe other uh, panelists also will add one or two you know, in, on this uh, importance. Thank you very much. We thank you for uh, the opportunity uh, and then what you uh, I, would, I would like to add something. Okay, thank uh, you. Uh, yes. Um, in, let's, let's look at um, the, uh, the World Health Organization data. In 2018, about 71% of deaths were due to chronic illnesses. And um, these illnesses were more among the elderly uh, patients. And so if you look at what chronic Ill diseases are, they are diseases that have modifiable uh, factors. So such as um, smoking cessation, alcohol, um, disuse, and um, a physical inactivity, alcohol use and physical inactivity with obesity and the likes. So if you look at this and you want to, uh, this, Chronic diseases increase the economic burden on patients and also also increase the workload on to the hospital, to healthcare providers. So digital health is an important tool that can promote self-monitoring and self-management for patients. So for example, um, a chronic heart failure patient comes to the hospital, um, you can he can monitor his blood pressure and weight remotely and then communicate the findings to the physician who will have an input to his management. That's one aspect. So digital health is so important these days that uh, we cannot do without it. Thank you, Dr. Jamila. Um, you, you did mention about how digital tools, especially what we refer to as the wearable digital tools, the one people who wear and do self-monitoring at home, like blood pressure machine. In fact, presently there are some the items that actually devices that look like wrist watches that people actually use to monitor their blood pressure, monitor their heart rate. In fact, recently, uh, when I was passing through the city, uh, one, I mean, I was called upon to come and stand on a particular device. And the operator was trying to convince me that by standing on the device, uh, the, the device could actually cleanse my blood and uh, I mean, remove all sorts of diseases that. Uh, I was actually probably happy, and uh, to, to some extent, I was wondering, has this had gone to this extent? Does it mean by just standing on a device, uh, infectious diseases, hypertension, diabetes could be eliminated from my body? So uh, it, it kept me wanting. So I would like to know um, from Dr. Irifan, I mean, what are some of these 
various, what are some of the various ways digital uh, health has actually been used, especially in the era of health promotion? Um, I'm sorry, Wendy, could you repeat? I think I'm having some internet issues. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah, sorry, I don't know if you can hear me well. I wanted to know from your own point of view what some of the various uh, digital health devices that have actually been used in promoting health. From your own experience, how digital tools have been used to promote health? So, uh, what, what I have seen here, um, because we live in a very underdeveloped country or a, how they call it a third, third world country where access to internet and access to technology is very limited. Um, and uh, there are different factors for that. Um, of course, financial conditions being uh, a major factor, right? However, um, Pakistan has around 54% of population that uses mobile phones and internet, which is, um, uh, I was actually, um, Kind of shocked. I, I wasn't expecting that many people using internet and all that. Um, the um, pandemic of COVID kind of changed everything, being physical, as my um, colleague mentioned here, to online. Um, all the sectors went from working in the um, offices to working from home, including health. And that kind of, uh, you saw a surge in the health apps at that time. Um, however, this was not seen much in uh, Pakistan. We did have some um, applications. People tried to come up with some application for telehealth, like where you can just sit at home and um, um, just con contact your doctor, which was, of course, more convenient. It increased accessibility of the population to the doctors, um, which is very important, especially in a country where um, health is not uh, very much accessible, I would, yeah. So, and it is um, centralized um, in the bigger con bigger cities of the province. The better hospitals are um, in the bigger cities in the, in the district centers and everything. And um, um, which makes it inaccessible to the people living in the rural areas and everything. However, um, I'm seeing this, this phenomena of people adopting to um, the watches. The digital watches like smart watches and everything um like um, there was a person who i know and he had a, a myocardial infarction and after that he was like okay maybe i should be more uh, monitoring my health more uh, and more practically so he bought a he bought a watch he invested in it and he actually uses it to keep a record of his um, heartbeats the heart rate um, i don't know how authentic their ecg is but um um, they, it does have that function. So yeah, people are, uh, the problem is it's lack of awareness and adoption of this technology um, is still at very, very early stages in, in Pakistan, if we are to speak about. Thank you so much for your uh, contribution as you observed in your country and in your area of practice. Uh, this webinar actually is focusing on how the mobile and uh, sorry digital technology has been changing the face of health promotion in um, low and in, uh, middle income countries. So basically, uh, Pakistan still fall within the low and middle income countries like Cameroon, Nigeria as well. I understand that uh, when you look at the different aspect of digital technology, uh, looking at ML, I mean mobile health. A lot of pregnant women nowadays can actually sit at the comfort of their home and then get reminder messages about their antenatal care, vaccination. And uh, these are all aspects of digital health that have actually improved uh, health promotion in far to reach uh, areas. And then when you look at telemedicine itself, you realize that people have actually benefited um, using uh, telecommunication consultations and in different parts of the world. But, um, Dr. Jamila, at your level where you, you as a family physician, how has digital technology been used? Or how do you think family physician could contribute to uh, promoting the use of digital health promotion? Oh, well, thank you for this question. Um, family physicians are frontline physicians. So they are at um, first contact care. So you see the family physician before you see any other doctor in the hospital. So it's very important that as, um, as frontline 
providers of frontline care. We see patients, we enlighten them, we educate them about digital health so that they can take more charge of their health. And so sensitization and education is very important. And then um, if you are looking at the care of the patient when it comes to the hospital, it's like a window to the family. So the, the family physician can also educate the family members and maybe identify key people who are able to use this, this technology. And then they'll be able to educate those that do not have that knowledge because at the end of the day, it's just lack of awareness that we actually have about the digital um, devices. They are available, but we are not using them. And then we can also act as advocates because to government, to NGOs, because there has been a lot of pilot um, studies, uh, pilot um, programs that they bring these digital devices for use, but we should go beyond um, that and then um, harness, build it most in the national level so that um, these investors or digital health innovators can come in and invest more so we could advocate to, um, in that regard. And then in research, uh, with just the click of a button using the electronic medical records, you can assess information, you can do your research, and then you can compare outcomes of different diseases just, just with a click of a button and you can assess materials easily. And so in that area, family physicians are well suited to teach people about um, this um, device. Thank you so much, Dr. Jamila. Um, I'll come back to you, uh, uh, Harry. Who, who do we think could actually be the key players? I mean, when you look at the use of digital technology in Africa, who are the key players to promote and this, especially when it comes to health promotion? Uh, thank you. So personally, I, I believe uh, we all are key players when it comes to digital health and, and using digital technology to improve on uh, population health and individual health. Uh, why I say so, because we all have a critical role to play in 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 this uh, in the health of in our health first as individuals and also in the health of uh, the community. So you have uh, the role of the government, which is more in terms of implementing policies uh, that allow the implementation of digital health uh, uh, techniques and, and approaches. But you also have um, uh, the role of the individuals themselves in order to accept these approaches. Uh, you know, to, to make themselves willing to, to accept these this, uh, new approaches, these new ways of, of looking at health uh, and healthcare, uh, which is uh, uh, amazing, I would say. So I, I, in, in essence, what I'm saying is everyone has a role to play in this. Uh, at every level, the healthcare workers, the, the policy makers, the users, the end users of this app, which is uh, you and I in the community, we all have a critical role to play at one point or the other. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Henry. That also brings us to the fact that if you look at digital health technology, it, it, it doesn't just work alone. You probably need mobile telecommunication uh, industry to play a role, uh, probably as much as uh, making electricity available to the community. So when you look at digital health to some extent in Africa, uh, probably even though there is a high use of uh, mobile technology, I mean mobile phones in Africa, but there are still some limitations to the extent uh, of digital health coverage, especially when we talk about health promotion. What do you say could be the um, some of the hinder? Maybe uh, we could hear from Dr. Justice. Oh, okay. Okay, yes. Uh, first of all, let me make an insight. You know, the world is evolving. And uh, at a point, you find out that you're seeing a patient and then this patient is telling you the diagnosis already. I don't know if it has happened to you before. Now, how did yeah. that come about? It came about because some people are already on, you know, their hands on tab and then they are already immediately say, okay, I have, um, let me say for us in the West Africa here, malaria is endemic. 
they're already Googling the symptoms and all of that right in your front, right in your consulting room. Because this is actually where some of these fallouts, you know, started. If we look at, you know, history way back. Now, going forward, you find out that it's not become, uh, I, I just want to uh, make an insight on who has a role in developing data health tools as it were. Now you find out that sometimes the programmers or the IT personnel or whoever puts some of these watches as or the tools that we use today, you find out that the input, we, ha we have to be the drivers truly because some people may have been misled. Some people may have misinterpreted, you know, um, some of the findings. Some people now go in our communities, even the rural communities, becoming doctors overnight without proper licensing and certifications. So these are the, 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 the limitations that could arise if they are not properly censored and in line with the best practices of medical you know, uh, uh, practice, which is evidence-based largely. So I have to bring that to fore because in this rising uh, data era, technology era and all of that, we have to be at the driver's seat promoting health tools. Now, coming about uh, the limitations, we look at the age ranges, especially the, the very advanced people, the very elderly, the very older you know, population. Most of them are not technology savvy. In our current situation, in our current environment now, the young minds or the young brains, in fact, as, as early as three years, five years, children are using phones, children are using one um, um, technology or the other. And you're gonna be shocked at the outcome. So first of all, the elderly ones, most of them are not IT savvy, and so they may be kicked out. Most of them, the educational level are not so you know, um, strong enough because of the fact that they play the fatherly role and all of that, they may not have so much time you know, to look into uh, those fine details. So those are the, what I call social demographic you know, limitations or factors that influence the use of uh, you know, data health tools. Again, income. When it comes to data health tools, as it were, when you compare rural and urban dichotomy, you find out that more people within the urban settings or those who are the, um, the wealthy people, so to speak, as against the average community person who is just living or survivor. So you find that when it comes to income, that also plays a role because some of these data health tools, in as much as they are very um, uh, useful, maybe a bit, um, cost ineffective for a lot of a wide range of people in the community. So if you look at the cost implications as well, you also look at on the long run maintenance to some extent, some of them have you know, maintenance um, uh, 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 challenges. You now look at the fact that if, you're, if, if your income is not good enough, then we're talking about some, you know, some people shy away from there. We also look at the access, internet access as it were, is also a very key factor when it comes to you know, how far you can assess data health tools or its application as um, when it now comes back to health uh, uh, use, so to speak. So generally, by and large, uh, the age factor comes in, educational level comes in, income comes in. Of course, um, the level of literacy, which I also you know, talked about in terms of who is interpreting what, because it's not enough that you're wearing a health or a data tool in the form of a wearable wristwatch. When you've, okay, some people, they say, oh, the BP is so so and so, or the pulse is so so and so. Who interprets that? How much health information, how highly uh, literate health-wise is that person to interpret whatever the outcome of that uh, you know, tool? So these are some that could hamper um, you know, um, or influence the use of data health tools. Thank you very much. Thank you just so much. To add, I, I just to add, Dr. Ballary, just to add, um, yes, Dr. Ohakari, you're right, because if you, the, the most important thing is the end user input when you are developing a tool. 
So it has to be a, a tool that is simple to use, that is easy to operate and can be adapted to other, to the, a whole lot of um, the population. Then again, um, another issue is resistance to change. Yeah, because uh, I remember in Federal Medical Center, uh, the medical director, Prof. Saad, wanted to, is e-compliant to say, um, he wanted to start from primary care, the general operation department. And so he brought digit, uh, the EMR. And the first response to that EMR was resistance. People didn't want to move away from the traditional way we do things. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's um, and this I will attribute to maybe um, the lack of ICT knowledge or IT knowledge. Look at um, look at medical school. We are not there was no curriculum to teach us computers. We only acquired the computer knowledge from um, by self, you know, self learning and all. So that in itself is one of is a challenge. So, but that but eventually, when you put your foot down, people tend to really see the use and it is easy to use and people comply. Thank you so much for that addition. You tried to uh, lead us towards discussing how these uh, tools could be uh, used or promoted. I mean, uh, taking into consideration that the development of these tools have to be contextualized uh, because probably you may produce a tool that need to help people in rural communities, but uh, the producer might have failed to take into consideration and that uh, these people may not be able to read and write, but please take into consideration the different uh, languages that are applicable. I think um, if, when you look, look at some, some of the tools, uh, some of them try to use uh, symbols, pictures that will be self-explanatory, and probably that might also help uh, women who uh, children and adults who may be exposed to the use of these tools. And then you also mentioned about the fact that some of these tools may be available, but the interpretation of what is measured will also be a problem. So how do we take this into consideration when we are trying to promote it? How do we actually uh, uh, improve the use of digital health tools, especially health promotion? I mean, if you look at, uh, when you open the Facebook, you could see somebody telling you advertising on uh, how you could use a particular tool to do exercise, control blood pressure. So, how do we actually encourage that the message that is passed in the use of either wearables, mobile apps, is the one that should actually be used in air promotion? And maybe from you, Henry. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so, I will tackle this from uh, two ends. First, uh, from the level of the manufacturers. So, uh, producing a device that is uh, supposed to be used for health promotion purposes within uh, the setting like ours, which is uh, 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 low income. And we know the demographics in terms of level of education and all that. I believe at the level of the manufacturers, they are supposed to provide or make the platform user friendly and provide all necessary information that each participant can interpret their own health records at least the, the basic and common indicators should be able to, should, you should be able to build capacity among the uh, users of your device or your, your, your platform for them to be able to interpret the results they see. For instance, if you are providing a platform uh, for monitoring uh, blood pressure, what does the figure mean? What is the normal range? So I think things like this, should be provided within the framework of the app so that that will also serve as a motivation to uh, the users to work more towards uh, improving their health status and all that. So I think at the level of the manufacturers, more information needs to be provided within the app to make it user-friendly and interpretable, the results interpretable. Because if you don't provide this information, it is now left uh, in the hands of the user to make their own interpretation, which brings a bigger challenge to the healthcare setting. 
So I believe at the level of the manufacturer, you should provide enough information, uh, not too much information, but information that is adequate enough for people to make informed judgment of their health status. Another take should be on the side of us uh, health workers and the health force. We should be vigorous in terms of providing health information, sensitization, such that we get to a point where the society is health aware of uh, different uh, health indicators that they could uh, potentially uh, make a basic interpretation about uh, or basic judgment about their lifestyle and, and health indicators that most of, most of these uh, uh, e-health platforms and, and digital uh, devices uh, provide. So we, on, on the side of the health force and, and researchers, we should provide uh, enough sensitization of the public, uh, enough information for them to be able to make judgment, but also on the side of the manufacturers, provide adequate information for them to be able to interpret what they see uh, while using the apps. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. We have about six minutes and we may have to take a question online. I can okay. see that uh, somebody just asked a question um, that is from Donald Asenendongo that to promote health, digital technology doesn't need to have contact of many people. Uh, probably you wanted to write you, our community. Uh, I don't know if this is, there is a question mark there, and uh, probably what the person is writing doesn't really look like a question to me, but I don't know if anybody could understand what the person is saying, that to promote health with digital technology does not need to have contact of many uh, people. And then there's another question, Antem and Tony, with the crazy tenet of misinformation and disinformation that exists via a media outlet today, what measures are taken by actors to counter fake news that uh, can be detrimental to the public? when we look at the use of digital tools uh, in promoting health, uh, how can this fake news be countered? Uh, 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 let, me, let me respond to that um, second question. Uh, I think uh, just like in every organized society, uh, it's very clear that some people uh, go out of you know, the norm. In other words, to be, we have a lot of quacks within our society parading themselves as you know, medical doctors, uh, opening clinics, opening hospitals, and um, of course, eventually um, giving wrong diagnosis, so to speak. That is just the same picture when it comes to data health tools. You know, um, the drivers, like I said, uh, we have to wake up to the fact that this thing is already here. You know, the earlier the medical, uh, um, the medical doctors or the health workforce come to understand the fact that there are a lot of information on the on the internet. So policies or um, uh, uh, th th there's going to be a need to enforce some of these uh, 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 policies or fake news, so to speak. So I think that one of the things we have to take home from this section is the fact that in our various countries, in our various um, areas of practice, we should start looking towards, you know, getting towards um, driving policies that have to look down on pulling down, especially some of those fake information, because so many people are on the internet that you can see than, than you can see on the road. A lot of people are online. So the earlier we start really also checkmating those excesses, the better for, for us. Um, let me also add that especially for the, for the rural communities. Most cultures, when they talk about health issues, it looks to them as a taboo. So how do you drive data health tools to such you know, areas? That means you have to really be up and, and doing. Try to also see how you can culturally integrate, even linguistically, the language of the people into these apps, and then give our proper information and guide. If not, I'm seeing a situation where everybody or every home, we just feel like, oh, I have fever, I have this, I have this. They, they just go to the app and diagnose themselves 
And of course, it's going to be really suicidal. Um, let me give other thank you. Thank you. panelists to- Thank you so much it. for your contribution. I want to um, probably get a take home message from each of the participants. We are rounding up, uh, probably a minute uh, to uh, give us a take home message uh, when it comes to uh, the use of this uh, uh, various avalanche of digital tools in promoting healthcare. Because from what we all understood, some of them actually may be doing what they are meant to do. and probably some may be deceitful because at the end, it could be a tool that is produced by uh, the manufacturers uh, for marketing. So uh, maybe uh, Dr. Infran, what could be your take home? One minute, please. Yes, it is mainly that um, the e-health or uh, it, as, as, um, as much as it has increased the accessibility to people, it is a double-edged sword. It can be used for something good, but also something bad also. Um, when it comes to male interpretation, a uh, layman, a common man cannot interpret even the basic things like raised um, heart rate uh, or something like that. Uh, there could be a thousand reasons behind that. There couldn't be any other, any reason. So um, I would just like to um, talk about one thing that I think, one, one way that I think that uh, digital health uh, could be actually utilized in a better way. Um, and that is to collect uh, data for early warning um, for epidemics and uh, pandemics and all that. I've seen some um, examples of some system. There was a system um, implemented in Yemen uh, pre-COVID and um, uh, some districts of Pakistan also, where the local um, healthcare providers, the, the, the ones on the most primary level, uh, the small clinics in the villages, they were given some system where they would input all the data, their diagnosis for all the patients that come in. So this data was then centralized and it would uh, give them a warning if there is a um, rise in say, for example, malaria in at a certain reason. So the center would know where to focus and they will have an um, early warning to pick up like, okay, this is where we need to act. And uh, they could be different, uh, uh, could be used for all kinds of other Sorry, my throat is hurting. Um, Thank you I, so much. Uh, what could be your take home as well, Dr. Uh, Jamila Yunusa? Well, One minute, please. I'll say, I'll say there are advantages, great advantages of using the digital tool. It will reduce the patient load to the hospital. And then um, the it will also improve relationship between the healthcare provider and the patient because the patient will always relate their information from the digital devices they get for interpretation. So I will say yes, it will improve um, the general outcome of the general out, um, patient outcomes in terms of indices, in terms of decreasing mobility and even mortality. Thank you so much. Um, what about, uh, what could be your take home message, Henry? Uh, thank you so much. So there is uh, a huge potential when it comes to uh, digital health and digital health tools in health uh, promotion. And I believe that this also brings uh, opportunities and challenges as well. So my take home is that uh, we should implement but as well, make we go the extra mile to contextualize these uh, uh, these tools, uh, taking into cognizance where they are going to be used, so that uh, uh, the information that is provided to participants are accurate and well needed within the context where they find themselves, and also try as health workers and and, and uh, stakeholders within the the health domain to provide as much information and help debunk the uh, negative and misinformation that is circulated uh, when it comes to digital health. Because the potential for this in future is, is really huge. And as such, you need, in order to maximize that, you need to uh, 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 discard uh, misinformation that might interrupt the benefits of uh, this uh, uh, new technology. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we had some emerging questions online. We had questions from uh, Tafi Gwenze, 
who was actually looking at and making contribution regarding the ethical issues related to the use of digital tools and related to low and middle income countries, how uh, this data issue, especially when it comes to ethical concerns, could be addressed. Unfortunately, um, we actually draw the curtains of this webinar and we may not be able to answer that right now, but I want to believe that we'll continue to engage uh, through communication and uh, sorry, through email communication and other means to further discuss this further. And we also had a question from Michelle Boris Ben Bella Owona, who actually was very interested to know how this uh, digital tool could actually be used to associate traditional and then modern medical care. But unfortunately, we are exceeding the time allocation for this webinar. And then we, I want to take this opportunity to thank all the panelists and also those who took their time to join this session. Uh, to the uh, we we appreciate. Thank you so much for participating, and we engage the communication uh, using the email contact that have been shared, and they will try as much as possible to um, probably address this question directly to those that ask them. All right, thank you. All those who are online, please thank you. This webinar session was sponsored is sponsored by um, the Grand Challenge Canada, uh, uh, that is uh, Grand Challenge is funded by the government of Canada. And it's been part of a project which they are funding called Bonfine. It's a project that is actually, I mean, was designed by uh, the University of Ottawa in collaboration with the OS system. And then we are actually implementing the project here. We are, I mean, the Dennis and Leonora for Intel Foundation in Yaoundé, Cameroon. And the implementation is done in collaboration with CRS in Akonuniga as well. Thank you so much. And then God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you.